Hello, my name is Trish Lynch from IOHR in London. Thank you for being with us for another episode of our Human Rights TV. In recent years, an increasing number of vulnerable individuals have been radicalised and have come to support terrorism and extremist ideology. As a result, disarming the process of radicalisation has gained enormous importance for governments around the world. With us today is Nina Kasagi, a religion scientist at the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Göttingen in Germany. Her research areas include the Salafist movement in Germany and other European countries, different forms of extremism and de-radicalisation approaches. Nina, good to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Now, in order to complete your PhD thesis titled The Contemporary Salafi Scene in Germany and its European Networks, you conducted 175 interviews with Salafist preachers and their followers in 10 different countries. Tell me what the main misconception about Salafist is and how do they differ from Salafi jihadist? So I conducted interviews in eight different European countries eight, okay. with uh, um, adherents and uh, preachers from the Salafi movement and I um, categorize um, those person with which I um, had those interviews in three categories mm -hmm. based on the research of Quinton Viktorovich. It's um, the quietest one, uh, the political ones and um, the jihadist ones. And the jihadist ones, are, um, um, one of them are more cognitive jihadists, so they think about um, being a violent person to, um, to change society. Um, in terms of uh, the Sharia law and um, the other part of those jihadists are um, very militant. They okay. want to use violence to change something. In your published research too, you identified three different types of radicalized militants. Could you tell me more about these different types of militants? Yes, um, the first one, um, those are the quietest ones. Yeah. Um, mostly in Europe live the quietest ones um, and they um, don't want to go into politics because one of the famous scholars uh, Al Albani told them the best politics is um, to step out politics okay. not to be included and so they are trying to um, give speech on um, the Prophet Muhammad saying uh, the Quran and so on and then there's a second group um, uh, the politic Salafis and um, they want to change something. They do, um, you might say, the jihad at dawa what means um, um, they want to change something by inviting people to listen to them. They go on the street, for example, mm -hmm. in all of the European countries we, th we have this uh, lease movement um, based on the first line uh, in the Quran, Ikra, you have to read, to understand, to learn, and then you can change society for Allah's sake. Uh, and the, second, uh, the third one, uh, sorry, is um, um, uh, the jihadist um, side. And they want to change the society uh, in terms uh, of Allah's law, uh, which is uh, the Sharia. And um, they can't stand the feeling that they live in um, societies made by men. Okay. Because they want to live in something that uh, was built uh, on the law from Allah. Nina, do you think that many of the interviewees that you spoke to joined these terrorist groups because of an identity crisis? And can you tell me about other vulnerabilities that would convince people to go down this particular path? Yes. Um, some of them <coughs> wanted to join, for example, uh, the um, Jaish al-Fatah, mm -hmm. uh, the former Jabhat al-Nusra Fund, it's Al-Qaeda affiliated, uh, with which I uh, talked, because um, they didn't find a job. Uh, in Europe, for example, they had no uh, personal perspective to go on in their own country. They were discriminated um, by looking different somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the women also um, uh, were sexually abused. And they get used, somehow used to this feeling and they... It becomes normal for them. Yes, somehow, somehow you might say this, and um, this feeling is, um, is used from um, those jihadis who wanted them uh, to be a part of this movement, who wanted them uh, to, um, to go in an another country to Iraq and Syria and to fight for uh, their ideas. 
but not the ideas um, are the main points um, because women wanted to join. Um, those other points were more popular for them, mm -hmm. more important, you might say. And we know that social media platforms play a huge role in radicalising young people. How can people be radicalised so easy by social media without ever having physical contact with those that are grooming these vulnerable people? I don't know if it really is easy, but um, it is like, first of all, you have to see those people are very young. Mm -hmm. And when you're young, um, it might be a little bit easier to <coughs> convince you to um, to go to uh, a peer group. So we had in the 80s the punks, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. And um, now we have um, those movements based on so-called religious ideas. And um, for example, maybe I, I might bring an example of my uh, case studies. I um, interviewed um, a 16-year-old girl mm -hmm. in the UK and she uh, became a so-called uh, Salafistic uh, jihadist girl. Um, how could this happen? And I asked her, um, how did you get in contact? Is it online? Is mm -hmm. it in a mosque at school? And she told me there are different kind of ways I got uh, in touch uh, with this movement. First of all, I went to school and uh, some of my um, uh, closest friends told me, um, okay, I I've seen um, a, um, a, um, a very inspiring person. Uh, a young person, a student, mm -hmm. going to university and he's really, you know, like brilliant. He knows a lot of, about life. Um, he's not about all this uh, um, superficial uh, issues like uh, how many money do you have, uh, how is your appearance and mm -hmm. so on. And um, then she was attracted by those ideas. And after a while um, uh, they met each other um, in a kind of religious meeting you might uh, say or together with others and um, they started to pray she never prayed before because in in her family it's a secular family and religion was something evil <laughs> or something we are not talking about because it's nonsense and so this makes sense for her and this gives her uh, the feeling that that it's okay to be a religious person not an extremist person uh, we have to, uh, you know, divide those uh, two types, and um, then um, he built up trust. And after a while, when there was trust, he was going to show her videos, and in those videos, women were raped. So uh, she was like uh, feeling uh, so much uh, empathy um, uh, for these women, how uh, and why uh, were they raped. And um, this uh, young man, the, the so-called preacher, told her, yeah, these were uh, the kuffar, the infidels. And um, they come from the West and they wanted to, you know, like uh, destroy everything that comes from Quran, that comes from uh, Islam, from our religion. Mm -hmm. And um, then step by step, uh, she got engaged in this What story. kind of time frame are we talking about? How long? on average with this take, well, in this particular case? Oh, to ask a scientist about average time, <laughs> pretty... Well, uh, was it weeks, was it months, did it take a year? It depends, it really depends on the case. Um, um, in fact, um, at this case it, um, it was about uh, six months, and after six months she was you might say totally convinced that um, the so-called West, whatever this is, mm -hmm. um, is an enemy of the true believers, the Salaf al Salih, and uh, everybody who's following, and she's she's a part of it. And um, she, um, as being very young, she's very enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. You can see it. Uh, there are uh, pretty much studies to tell us when you're young, you're much more engaged in, in doing something, stand up for your rights okay. and, and maybe becoming violent as well. And so because of this, uh, she thought it was a good idea to step inside of this um, uh, movement, these ideas. You have said that out of 38 people that you interviewed, that you were able to change the minds of 35 of them not to go to Syria and join a terrorist group. Tell me, 
how you were able to do that. What was the secret to your success? Because 35 out of 38 is quite impressive, isn't it? Mm. This was beside my academic research. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have to make it clearly because when I do my interviews, I'm more doing it for my research and very um, uh, in a very analytic way. But um, after conducting those interviews, I still was in contact with the parents of those youngsters. Mm -hmm. And um, when their uh, uh, children wanted to um, go to Syria or to Iraq, they didn't know what to do. And um, first of all, you think they should have called the police because mm -hmm. they are responsible for it. Uh, but they, they were afraid because most of them came from a Russian um, route, from, uh, they were Russian migrants. And in, in Russia, um, the police situation is a little bit different than... So you don't involve the police? You, no, they, yeah. they, they, they won't do that. And um, then they gave me a call, and uh, though I'm also a human being, I think it's my human uh, duty to mm -hmm. help uh, others, not only to conduct interviews for my job, and then I say, okay, you uh, told me everything about your biography, your problems, mm -hmm. your aims, and then afterwards I will never uh, know you anymore. So this is, n this is no option for me. And then I, I went there and tried to help them out. Um, I can't go on the street if you show me a, a so-called radical and I say, okay, here in five minutes mm -hmm. I will, <laughs> you know, like de-radicalize the person. But on those 38 persons I know by heart somehow. And um, so I was, I was trying to find uh, the links. Uh, why? want they to go there. They want to engage themselves, they want to find a man for example and so on. And I could um, go via these points uh, into this argumentation and to help them and to explain uh, is this really something the Prophet Muhammad would like you to go? Mm -hmm. um, is this something the Prophet Muhammad who is a role model for all of them um, would really prefer uh, you to do and so on and so it, it was really hard I'm, I'm never giving up mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't so <laughs> after <laughs> this uh, uh, talking with with those persons I was I had a breakdown myself every time but uh, I have to do it because it's it's a duty for me somehow and um, I never forget that uh, three of them uh, uh, from whom we thought, the parents and, and I, we thought they wouldn't quit and they, uh, they quit. And so I, uh, I was sent... Um, and what happened to those three people? Yeah. Did they go and join a terrorist group? They did. Uh, they joined uh, the former uh, um, Jabhat al Nusra Front, this Al Qaeda uh, affiliate group, and uh, they were um, shut down. Mm -hmm. And then after this happens, uh, those um, militant members sent me the pictures of their broken bodies. Um, and I should, you know, like uh, give those pictures to the parents, um, which I didn't. Because I'm, I'm not a mother myself, but I, I uh, can, can imagine, imagine the impact that would have, yeah. how terrible this might be because um, but they, from their perspective, it's like you're a martyr and it's martyrdom and the parents should be proud. Uh, you know, uh, this is a terrible situation. I never forget them. When I go to bed, I think about them because um, it, it is really hard to, um, to, to see those young persons dying for nothing. Mm -hmm. they Based on your considerable experience in this field, how do you think countries now should deal with those returning fighters? Yeah. These are trained terrorists who, who fought alongside ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Countries, understandably, would be nervous about welcoming them back in. What do you think should happen? First of all, we, I think we should um, put it off the media because um, I don't want to blame, blame it all, the responsibility on the media, but um, um, 
in all of the countries when returnees will come back to their home countries, mm -hmm. the media blames them to be cruel, to be uh, aggressive and so on. But they don't uh, see the side that they might be also um, depressed. Uh, that they might quit of this um, um, movement as well, and so we have to um, to give these um, issues to the social workers. But that means that there should be so much more social workers. We have to uh, to uh, to invest more money in. Um, and organizations like the IOHR, um, who is trying to uh, reintegrate okay. and who has the skills to, um, to, to understand how people can go so far and how they could um, become uh, a normal citizen again. But um, that takes time. And um, another point might be, um, the problem of reintegrating of, um, children as well mm -hmm. when they are going to public schools. Are teachers um, in the position to reintegrate them I in a class? Uh, I think no, but on the other hand, shall they go to their private schools? Mm -hmm. That might be no good idea either. So uh, what shall we do? We have to discuss and to um, to do it step by step and with the help of um, um, each... It's a multi-organisational yes. thing, isn't it? Yes, it is. Everybody needs to get on board. Yeah. In your presentation for the IOHR Not Born a Radical initiative, you spoke about young girls from comfortable backgrounds, intelligent young girls from Western homes going over to Syria to become jihadi brides. Tell me what would convince a young girl from a comfortable background to go and do such a thing? Several motives uh, are there to mention. Um, for example, you have those girls, <coughs> really clever, but uh, their heart is, is, um, was broken, for example, by an ex-boyfriend or someone else. So they're um, looking for escape? Romance even I suppose. Yeah, the parents don't understand it because they think okay She's 14 or 15 or whatever. Um, this is the first love um, She will go along um, mm. um, so there will be no problem for her, but um, uh, She has this grievance inside and then um, She will maybe go online and there she she meets um, a so-called lion and this lion is... So what's a lion then? A big, yeah. powerful, strong alpha male, is it? Uh, he hasn't to be big, but <laughs> he yeah. pretends to be powerful, I suppose, yeah, yeah. a powerful person. And um, so uh, this, uh, this young or elderly man um, tells her, OK, so um, you're living in a society who is not good, not caring about you, not caring about um, you being a real woman. What is a real woman? In, um, uh, in their type of um, understanding, it's, it's a woman who is standing beside um, her husband for the whole life, doing what the husband wants her to do and doing what Allah wants her to do. And after a while, um, they control those little girls, um, as I might say, uh, 24 hours. And they, uh, you know, like right here on WhatsApp and so on. And they, um, and this control um, is getting higher and higher. And the parents can't get uh, um, uh, inside mm -hmm. anymore. And we might, uh, we might under uh, support them and uh, go into it with the help of social workers as well. So um, we have to interrupt this contact. But on the other hand, they are free to decide because we are living in a democracy. So what, what shall we do? Uh, we should talk about it. We should talk about it in, in, in class mm -hmm. very often. Um, and we should also go in the kindergarten from my um, point of view because... So from the grassroots or from the very earliest age, yeah, we need to be talking yeah, about this. Yeah, that would be very, very wise to do. Nina, not every young vulnerable girl that goes over to become a bride of ISIS is young and vulnerable. Many of them have another agenda. Tell me about the other side of it. 
Yeah, we have also um, uh, women who are very um, sadistic somehow and who have cruel tendencies to go and join, um, for example, uh, the Islamic State. And um, as we might see, we have um, women from the UK and also from France who wanted to join the so-called Al Khansa Brigade. Mm -hmm. And this is an uh, all-women's brigade um, who has done really harm things to other women who are, for example, not wearing the gloves or the right niqab. Um, uh, they tortured them and... Um, uh, and they've joined. So this is young girls, women from the UK and other countries yeah. going to join this group of women yeah. because they are statistic, yes. because this is what they want yes. to do. They want to do harm uh, to other people. For instance, uh, uh, was shown a video by a young girl who wanted to uh, join the Elchensa Brigade uh, from the UK and uh, she showed me uh, a video where a seven-year-old uh, girl was raped by uh, several men and she was laughing about it and I, uh, I couldn't really get it and I asked her how could you laugh about it because I'm <laughs> hardly uh, crying uh, when I see something like this and uh, she uh, told me okay um, uh, but this uh, has to happen you know you, you, you have to be uh, cruel against your enemies and so <laughs> even this young girl was an enemy mm -hmm. and that shows us that not all of those girls um, uh, trying to go uh, to the Khansa Brigade or trying to be a part of the um, uh, um, Salafi Jihadist uh, movement are so romantic or going, uh, trying to go to Syria or Iraq because of romantic reasons. They don't want to be pr treated like princes, but um, they themselves are sadistic. They have those tendencies somehow. And also it shows that um, they could be part um, of it and be part of those cruelties as well, their own. So I think, it, I think it's important to really underline here that going off for a romantic notion yeah. isn't the case. They themselves could be going into the lion's den of abuse, of serial attacks from other women yeah. as well as men, yeah. sexual exploitation. Yeah. It's a horrific world, isn't it? Yes, it is. Nina, thank you very much for joining us. We could talk all day about this, yeah. but thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you too. And thank you for joining us for another episode of IOHR TV, putting human rights into focus. Please keep up to date on our social media feeds or you can check out other videos on our website. Until next time, goodbye.